All right, guys. So what the hell is happening in Ecuador right now? What's happening is wild. I mean, it literally looks like it's a movie. It is that extreme and unbelievable. So let's start with this here. Um, what happened the other day is there were heavily armed gunmen with machine guns and pistols and grenades, and they took over an Ecuador TV station. Armed attackers hurling grenades disrupt live broadcasts, forcing staff to the floor. The, inc the incident amidst kidnappings and unrest follows President Noboa's 60-day emergency decree. So, um, clearly, something's very wrong. Something's amiss here. Now, who the hell are these people and what's going on? Uh, well, these are basically drug gangs. They're like narco-terrorist drug gangs. And so here, I'll show you this one as well. Uh, Ecuador police officers kidnapped. Explosions in cities. Prisons in chaos. A series of explosions across multiple cities in Ecuador have erupted. At least four police officers have been kidnapped in Makala and Quito. These events occur shortly after the escape of notorious narco boss Adolf Adolfo Macias from prison, escalating violence and lawlessness. Over 50 law enforcement officers are taken hostage in multiple prisons, intensifying the crisis. President Naboa has declared a state of emergency. So, understand something. Effectively, Ecuador is kind of already is a narco state in the sense that the drug gangs, the narco terrorists, hold certain territory, right? And one of the things that you see when you go through go through some of the articles on this is, like, a lot of the prisons are flat out run by the drug gangs. It's not really like there's a real government presence there. And so, now with them getting more aggressive, now with them getting more violent, now with them trying to break out the their gang leaders and stuff, everything's kind of falling apart. So... Uh, here's a statement by the president of Ecuador. There was a state of emergency declared and a declaration of martial law. Uh, the existence of an internal armed conflict that requires the mobilization of the armed forces and national police to retake the country from several criminal groups that have now been deemed as terrorist organizations operating against the state. So now this is like, shit has totally hit the fan. We got to do whatever we can to regain control. The government effectively is losing power. It's almost like a civil war attempt. It's like a coup attempt where the narco-terrorists are trying to take over the entire country. Um, here's a video of a soldier kicking a rebel in the head. But there's a lot of these very wild videos coming out. Um, I think we already went through this one here. Police officer kidnapped, explosions in cities. Yeah, we already went through this one. So let me walk you through more specifically what's happening. What's behind the chaos in Ecuador? Ecuador's worsening security situation deteriorated further in spectacular fashion this week with gunmen, in, with gunmen armed with explosives storming a TV station during a live broadcast. The country has been rocked by blasts, police kidnappings, and prison disturbances and a wave of violence authorities are struggling to contain. The immediate trigger was the prison escape of one of Ecuador's most powerful drug lords, but instability has been growing for years. Here's what we know. Why is Ecuador so violent? Ecuador, home to the Galapagos Islands and a tourist-friendly dollar economy, was once known as an island of peace, nestled between two of the world's largest cocaine producers, Peru and Colombia. But the country's deep ports have made it a key transit point for cocaine, making its way to consumers in the United States and Europe. And its dollarized economy also makes it a strategic location for traffickers seeking to launder money. Ecuadorian gangs are working with foreign syndicates, including Mexican cartels, Brazilian urban gangs, and even Albanian mafia cells, fueling the ongoing Christ conflict. These rival criminal organizations have been meeting out brutal and often public shows of violence in the country's streets and prisons in their battle to control drug trafficking routes. So it's a tale as old as time. You have all these competing uh, drug gangs, and they are trying to control their territory, control the routes, and you have one group infringing on another, and that leads to flat-out, all-out war in the streets, and civilians get caught in the crossfire. The prison system has long been the main theater of violence in Ecuador. Security forces have struggled to confront the gangs inside overcrowded prisons, where inmates often take control of branches of the penitentiaries and run criminal networks from behind bars, according to Ecuadorian authorities. And security and state forces have been badly unprepared for the rise of criminal groups in the country, lacking proper equipment, training, and strategy. Jesus. So this is, look, let's call it what it is. This is like Ecuador is no longer a functioning government in any way, shape, or form. This is the actual power on the ground is the drug gangs. Corruption allegations have also swirled around Ecuador's justice and security system. In 2022, the U.S. withdrew visas from high-ranking officers of the Ecuadorian state security forces alleged to be linked to drug trafficking, as well as several judges and lawyers. So in other words, some of the drug gangs bought out 
certain uh, members of the government and have effectively rigged it to let them get away with whatever they want to get away with. In the face of a worsening security situation, former President Guillermo Lasso implemented several states of emergencies, but they did little to stop the bloodletting. Widespread discontent with rocketing crime rates tanked Lasso's popularity, and he called for snap elections on August 20th, 2023. The violence took on an overtly political dimension during the campaign with the killings of presidential hopeful Fernando Villavicencio, and other local politicians demonstrating that organized crime groups were using violence in an attempt to influence policy. The new president, Daniel Naboa, won last year's runoff vote on a promise to tackle soaring crime, but now faces a crisis. The root of this week's violence is the escape of a high-profile gang leader, Adolfo Fido Macias, from a prison in Guayaquil on Sunday. Macias is the leader of Los Choneros, one of Ecuador's most feared gangs, which has been linked to maritime drug trafficking to Mexico and the United States, working with Mexico's Sinaloa cartel and the Oliver Sinistera Front in Colombia, according to the Insight Crime Research Center. In 2011, Fito was sentenced to 34 years in prison for crimes including drug trafficking and murder, according to Reuters. In response to the escape, Naboa declared a nationwide state of emergency and more than 3,000 police officers and members of the armed forces were deployed to find Macias. Following Fito's escape and the declaration, Ecuador's prison agency reported incidents in at least six prisons in different provinces on Sunday. Wow. So in other words, the drug gangs have control of the prisons, and they basically called for prison riots when the government decided to go after this escaped drug cartel leader. Holy cow. This is crazy. Criminal groups then embark, embarked on a wave of violent attacks and a show of strength designed to discourage efforts to crack down on their activities. That's only going to make them crack down more. At least eight people were killed in Guayaquil, Ecuador's largest city and also considered the most dangerous. Several police officers have been kidnapped. Police arrested 13 people for the storming of the police station, recovering firearms and grenades. What's the government doing in response? Naboa has declared an internal armed conflict in the country, basically a civil war, a coup attempt, ordering security forces to neutralize several criminal groups accused of spreading extreme violence. The state of emergency will last for 60 days and impose a nightly curfew from 11 p.m. to 5 a.m., Naboa said Monday, adding it grants security forces all the political and legal support for their actions. Naboa also said he had authorized security forces to retake control of the restive prison system, which he said has been lost, has been lost in recent years. Admiral Jamie Vela Irazo, head of the Joint Command of Ecuador's Armed Forces on Tuesday, vowed not to back down or negotiate with armed groups, adding the future of our country is at stake. From this moment on, every terrorist group identified in the aforementioned emergency decree have become a military target. The situation has also sparked concern throughout the region. Neighboring Colombia and Peru have expressed concern over the situation and support for the Naboa government to restore order. Officials in Peru said the country plans to declare an emergency along its entire northern border with Ecuador. Peru's interior minister has also ordered national police to reinforce security on the border, the interior ministry said. In a statement on X, a U.S. State Department official said the United States stands with the people of Ecuador and is ready to provide assistance to the Ecuadorian government. Wow. That we're, we're basically witnessing a failed state. Now, by the way, I was reminded of an old uh, fact that I read when reading about Ecuador now. It was just a few years back that the violence in Ecuador, linked directly to these drug cartels, was worse than the violence in Iraq at the peak of the Iraq War. There were more deaths, there was more crime, in Ecuador a few years back than there was during the peak of the Iraq war, the number of deaths in Iraq. I mean, that's that fact is mind-blowing. So it is more dangerous to be in Ecuador. And effectively what we have here is there is no real functioning government. They don't have control. They don't have power. You have different uh, narco-terrorist gangs that control different factions. They're vying for more territory, more roots, to have more control. And now this looks like this is the, the government stepping up and saying, look, we can't let this go anymore. Like, we have to, we got to crack down on these gangs. Now, by the way, what will be interesting to see is if they had the ability to do what El Salvador recently did. El Salvador recently did effectively a complete and utter crackdown on, on criminal gangs that were effectively running the country or trying to run the country. They had a tremendous amount of power and uh, very, you know, these are dangerous criminal types. And El Salvador did a total, complete crackdown where they cleaned up the streets, locked up everybody who's, like, gang-affiliated, and really sort of succeeded, in a sense, in getting them. But look, at the end of the day, it's a numbers game, right? So who has 
who has more support in terms of boots on the ground, who has more weapons, who has more money for a prolonged conflict on that one is probably going to be difficult. I mean, I don't know, the government of Ecuador versus these giant mega drug cartels that probably are flush with cash to the point where they don't even know what the fuck to do with all their cash. I don't know, but we're witnessing effectively a civil war between narco-terrorists and a nominal government that is probably so immensely corrupt and broken and porous that who even knows if they'll have the will to take on these narco-terrorists and fight and, you know, lose your life or something like this. So that's the big question. You know, are we looking at, is Ecuador going to be a similar situation to, like, Afghanistan? Where, like, the second the U.S. left, it, it was just like a total puppet government with a house of cards and the Taliban just came in and took it over like that. Are we going to be looking at, effectively, a narco-terror state officially in Ecuador? And another question is, would the U.S. kind of even allow that to exist? Or would the U.S. come in and back the government of Ecuador and try to, you know, fight back the, the drug gangs? Look, I'll say this, man. This is one of those situations where the, I, I don't see much gray area. I really don't. In terms, It's not like this, you know, oh, this is a ideological political group that has a different vision for the future, and that's why they're trying to take power. No, these are drug gangs. These are narco-terrorists, and... I'll be very interested to see if the government of Ecuador, the military of Ecuador, the police of Ecuador, if they can get this situation under control. And of course, you can't get through this entire segment without stating the obvious. I mean, you have to stop the bleeding now, right? You have to crack down on the narco-terrorists now. But also, let's not forget, uh, part and parcel of the problem here is the drug war. These, these narco-terrorist drug gangs shouldn't even exist. And if you... Uh, legalized, taxed, and regulated drugs across the board, then you would effectively put them out of business in a very short time span. And, like, that's what you have to do. Remember, guys, all of the, the black market crime that was associated with alcohol when we had prohibition, that's what made the mafia really strong, is that we had prohibition. So they ended up controlling the flow of it and making a lot of money. And then, you know, they could use that to branch out into other criminal enterprises. So the problem was the prohibition. We understand that perfectly with alcohol, and all the evidence proves it, and the history of it proves it with alcohol. We need to understand that about these other drugs. That, you know, the total prohibition and the war on drugs, that makes it so that these narco-terror gangs can exist. And you gotta put them out of business. You gotta put them out of business. But that's, that's like the, the long-term solution here that you should start on right now, right? But the short-term solution is... Yeah, you can't have drug gangs <laughs> running the streets uh, anywhere, right? You can't just have a whole nation that is a, a failed state that turns into a narco-terror haven. That's just, it's unacceptable. So I don't know what's going to happen from here, but just add this to the list of other things that are happening which show how the world is currently coming apart at the seams. All right, guys, that's the show. Love y'all very much, as always. Everybody do me a big favor. Please uh, subscribe to the channel. Deeply appreciate that. Helps in the algorithm massively. Costs you nothing. Uh, click that bell icon so you get a notification every single time a video drops. You click that like button if you indeed did like the video. If not, no big deal. It's all good. Still love you. And thank you to everybody who supports this show on Patreon. It means the world. Uh, the link's below if you'd like to do that. Or you could tip on YouTube with the thanks button as well. If you're so inclined. Never had a conversation with an advertiser. You guys help fund this show from the ground up. I'm deeply, deeply appreciative. And that's all I got for you guys, man. By the way, um, tune in for uh, Norm Finkelstein this week on Crystal Kyle and Friends. You're not going to want to miss that. That'll be a hell of a lot of fun. Of course, we're going to talk about the uh, genocide charges that South Africa is bringing against Israel, and we'll talk about the various horrific takes from many uh, goofball commentators on this. Uh, Norm will be unleashed, so we'll, we'll have that coming up in the future. Crystal Kyle and Friends, you can sign up for that below. All right, that's all I got for you guys, man. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. Hey, y'all, do me a favor and like and subscribe. It helps out big time in the algorithm. Click the bell as well for notifications when videos drop. And watch that video on screen right now. You know you want to.